Today, I will be installing an 18,000 BTU 240 volt mini split in my shop. It gets extremely hot here in Texas, so this project has made its way up to the top of my list. As a disclaimer, this video is for educational purposes only. I am not an electrician or an HVAC technician. With projects like these that involve electricity, they can be very dangerous. Electricity can and will kill you, so don't do anything dumb. I want to take a moment and note here that this is not a sponsored video. I bought this Della mini split unit from Amazon with my own money. And I did so because the last unit that I bought from them in my old shop performed very well. And the price point is just right. Speaking of price point, here's the approximate cost of this project up front so you all know what you're getting into. Some of this, like the concrete pad and the 100 feet of Romex, will be dependent on your specific circumstances and in some cases, optional altogether. I will do my best to put the links to all the items and tools used in this video in the description below and pin it as a top comment for your convenience. Full disclosure here is that these links are affiliate links and this channel does get a commission when used, which helps make videos like this possible. Now that you know the cost, let's get started with the install. Step one is going to be getting electrical run over to the other side of the shop from my breaker box. In my old shop, I ran metal encased MC cable along the walls. However, I wanted to do a cleaner install this time around behind the sheetrock. To see what I'm doing more efficiently and to have the room required to appropriately make a clamped connection to the top of my breaker box, I installed this access panel. All right, so we're up in the attic here. This back corner is gonna be where the panel is and the access panel above my breaker panel. The panel is all the way in this corner over here. You can kind of see those wires going down. I'm gonna use some fishing tape and I'm gonna see if I can get in that hole. And uh, I think that hole <coughs> should be large enough. It was a little tight with this thick taped up section at the front of my fishing line, but I was able to get it down into the wall cavity without major issue. I'm gonna make one suggestion to anyone looking to do a project like this with the electrical in the attic. Uh, wait till winter, cause it is hot up there. I am making sweat angels on my floor in the garage. It is super hot. Be careful. I know people can uh, die of heat stroke. I would highly suggest hydrating, taking breaks, and uh, maybe getting some electrolytes in there because uh, it's kind of dangerous being in the attic for, for the entire day. and. Uh, you know, 100 degree weather outside. So we have the wire pulled down to the panel. I'm gonna run it all the way across the attic. And on this side, I'm gonna be dropping down into a wall and coming out of the building. Now I've marked out some spots. My inside air handler is gonna be where that green dot is. And I'm gonna put the box on the outside, probably a little bit over towards this wall. One thing I learned in the last video is you don't want your disconnect box installed directly behind your unit outside. Uh, just because it makes it hard to get to it in case your unit's burning down or something. So you need to have your disconnect box offset to the unit outside. So to do that, I'm gonna be putting it right here. Now, I'm gonna drop a wire down from the attic, but I think I got lucky because there is an outlet right there. I'll be able to utilize the hole that was drilled in the top plate to snake my wire down so I don't have to drill another hole. So that's gonna save me a little bit of time and I'm gonna get started on that now. All righty, up in the attic. I have the wire attached to my fishing line here, my metal fishing line. And I also marked out the fishing line with that green piece of tape right there at six feet. That's exactly where the disconnect will be in the wall. Over here, I have my top plate that already has a hole in it for a piece of 12-2 Romex that runs an outlet. In order to make my life easy, I decided to core a three and a half inch hole in my sheetrock across from where my exterior disconnect box will be. This will help me pull wire down from the attic and get it through the smaller one and a quarter inch hole that I drilled into the brick. To get through the brick, I'm using the cheapest hammer drill I could find on Amazon that y'all may recognize from my Tesla wall charger install video. Considering I use it maybe once a year, it's perfect for my needs. From an order of operations perspective, it's easy to forget to put this clamp onto the Romex before installing your disconnect box to the wall. If you do make this mistake, you'll just have to take that box back off the wall and install the clamp. This is an Eaton 60 amp disconnect from Lowe's and these guys are easy to find and very affordable. I'm using some 3 16 of an inch by one and a quarter inch tap cons to anchor it to the brick. The 12-2 Romex from my wall will be wired up in the middle of the disconnect. Make sure to wrap your white wire with a piece of black tape in order to indicate that both lines are load and this is a 230 volt circuit. Over at the breaker box, I'll be installing a 15 amp dual pole breaker. 
Also note that my 12-2 Romex is coming into the top of my breaker box and secured with a standard clamping box connector that would have been almost impossible to install without having this access panel. I'm fairly sure I could have run 14-2 on this 15 amp circuit, but I wanted to err on the side of caution considering the length of the run. Like in the disconnect box, make sure that you wrap your white wire with black electrical tape to indicate that it's a load line. This time around, I'm going to be pouring a concrete slab and mounting my mini split to it. To keep the mini split above ground level, I ordered this metal stand, which I put together and added an additional coat of paint for longevity. I'll be pouring a three foot by two foot slab, so I need to make a frame. Since part of this frame will be backed up against the building, I decided to use some pocket screws on the side so I can get them out easily when the cement is set. I didn't have a fancy ground compactor, so I used one of the large stones and some inertia to attempt to do some packing. Then I used metal stakes to affix my frame in a level orientation before laying down a thin layer of gravel, which I also packed with my stone. To reinforce the concrete slab, I bent some quarter inch rebar and wired it together in a slightly elevated position above the gravel. I mixed up four 60 pound bags of cement for this slab in two separate wheelbarrow loads. A long 2x4 was used to screed the surface of the slab flush with my frame and I used an edge trawler to get the corners nice and round. I am for sure not an expert cementer and you'll see some flaws in the sides of my slab after I pull off the frames. I think I could have gone with a wetter mixture to have prevented some of the pitting, but for this fairly light application I think this slab will suffice. The next step on this project is going to be getting a hole in the wall that our refrigerant lines, drain line, and the power slash control cable for my air handler will go through. I'll be making this a three and a half inch hole so that I can accommodate a larger piece of three and a half inch PVC. Note that I'll gently slope this hole outwards to aid in drainage from the air handler. This slope was accomplished by using the partially cored hole in my brick as a guide to transfer the center to the sheetrock with a long drill bit canted slightly at an angle. With the bore made into my wall, I was able to insert the PVC pipe and mark it where I needed to cut it down for a flush fit. This is probably an unnecessary step, but I mixed up some epoxy to fill in the gap around the PVC on the inside, not only to act as a seal, but also to provide a little bit of holding power for this assembly. On the outside, I just used some silicone around the OD of the PVC. Using the provided template from Della, I lined up my hole and transferred drill points onto the wall. I tried to do this in line with my studs for the strongest hold. I will note here that this is a spot where I made a mistake. I should have offset the template to the left a little more since my 3.5 inch hole is larger than the hole required on the template. This mistake resulted in me being able to see some of the edges of the hole when looking up at the unit after being installed. It's not a big deal, but it's just kind of irritating from a fit and finish perspective. Wiring the inside unit is very straightforward and there is a clean wiring diagram provided. It was a little hard to get a proper filming angle of this wiring while I was doing it, but here's the finished product. Now here you can see the results of what I consider to be the second mistake made on this install. Normally on a unit like this, you'd have the hole going through your wall on the right side, not the left. By doing this, you'd be able to bend out the lines from the air handler and poke them through the wall when you mount it, thus allowing you to make the connections to the long refrigerant lines outside in a more convenient manner. I did not think of this when laying out my install. This left hole orientation will require me to make the connection of both the 6mm and 12mm lines to the air handler inside the building, then poke it all through the hole. One thing I don't love about this unit is that the lines are 12 millimeter and six millimeter, which from what I can tell are not as common as the Imperial 3 8 and quarter inch lines. Also, I get the feeling that these copper lines are more fragile than my last install, but that could be in my head. No matter what the case is, I ended up over torquing the six millimeter line when trying to achieve the torque settings in the manual and had to cut and reflare this line multiple times. If you're going to be undertaking a mini split project like this, I'd highly recommend picking up this flaring tool that has both imperial and metric sizes and is much more convenient to use than the cheap big box store models. Using this tool is pretty straightforward. I like to let the copper stick out of the clamp by around 1 16th of an inch. I put a little bit of nylog on the tip of the cone to help lubricate this process. I then line up the cone with the opening of the copper and start tightening. 
There are indents at each station on the clamp that makes the lineup easy. Once you hit the appropriate tension, the handle will actually release, saving you from over torquing this flare. A couple of notes about this six millimeter copper connection. First of all, I don't love how this isn't like perfectly square. It kind of comes out at a little bit of an angle here to the right, but I feel like I did everything right. So I'm going to leave it. I did torque this up to maybe uh, about 12 Newton meters. The manual calls out for much more. And uh, I feel like, I feel like I'm going to break something if I keep going. So uh, I'm going to leave this guy at 12 and you know, if I have a leak in the system, I may have to take this off the wall, but I have cut this a few times now and this is the best I've done. I will also note that I don't like how there's an indent uh, where my cutting tool kind of clamps on to this piece of copper. Uh, I am using the six millimeter section. So uh, once again, it's as good as it's gonna get. This is a precarious part of the project forced by the left side hole that I was talking about earlier. I carefully moved the air handler with the connected lines towards the wall and then hoisted it up onto the mount. You want to be very delicate here since the six millimeter line can easily be kinked. I had a ladder outside accepting some of the weight of these lines to help prevent this. With the air handler installed, you can gently bend these lines as they exit the building and then mock up where the line set cover will land. These line set cover sets are extremely cheap and add a layer of professionalism to your install. Next up, we'll be connecting the refrigerant lines to the unit, so it's time to get the stand and outdoor condenser sitting on the slab. With a lot of these pre-charged units, you can skip all of the cutting and flaring and just coil up the extra line behind the unit, but I feel like it's a neater look to just cut the lines to your application. I do make sure to bend them in such a way that I'd have slack if needed in case of a leaking connection since to repair that, you would need to cut away some more line and reflare it. Also, when you're resizing these lines, make sure to put the connecting nut back on before flaring. You can see here I forgot to do that and I needed to cut and flare again. When installing these lines, I put a little nylog on the mating surfaces for a long-term seal. I also try to hold the line as straight as possible as I snug down the connector. This does seem to make a difference, so take your time here and line everything up. Like on the inside connections, I think the torque ratings are a little high in the manual, so I actually ended up going by feel to some degree. Even then, I suspected that I may have over-torqued the 6mm connection, which is why I went out of my way to run a positive pressure test on the system later in the install in order to verify that I'm solid. The first test you can run to make sure your line set isn't leaking is a vacuum test. I'm going to be using the same vacuum pump I purchased for my first install along with the gauge set. On this test, I did not remove the straighter valve, which if I did would have sped up the process. I just ran the vacuum pump for around 45 minutes, pulling the system down to around negative 28 to negative 30 PSI. As mentioned, I will be performing a positive pressure test on this system with nitrogen later, so this is really just an initial leak test. On my first split system install years ago, I called it good after this vacuum test, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that method. I just wanted to be extra sure on this one with a positive test due to my misgivings with the torque settings on the copper, and because I had a friend tell me recently that his install passed a vacuum, but failed on the positive test. So that's what motivated me to go down the nitrogen route. While the vacuum pump is running, I continued on with the wiring portion of the install. I ordered a pre-made 10 gauge whip for this install because I couldn't find any 12 gauge pre-made whips online. This was a mistake since it was very difficult to get the 10 American wire gauge stranded copper into the mini split connection ports. I got them in there, but I would have been better off making my own line set with either 14 or 12 gauge THWN wire. Also note there is a little holder for the cable glands that should be affixed to the unit before the cover. This allows you to get the wires all in the right orientation before installing the cover over them. A couple of things I added was a black cable gland for the wire coming from the air handler and some weather stripping not shown here around the cover since it wasn't perfectly flush. Over on the 16 amp disconnect all you need to do is knock out a spot and screw in a connector on the WIPS 90 degree cable gland. The pre-crimped connections on the whip would not work on either end of this install, so I just cut and stripped the wires to fit. The black and red load wires will be installed on the outside of the disconnects connection block. With the electrical complete, we can go back and check on the line set. Still holding strong in the same spot after an hour sitting here, so I'm going to call that good. I was able to rent this 40 pound charged nitrogen bottle for about 45 bucks from my local welding supply shop and I just ordered some budget gauges from Amazon for this project. 
After I'm done with this pressure test, I'll just store that gauge set along with my vacuum pump so that it will be ready for the next time I install a mini split. In order to not have any restrictions from my test, I used this tool to remove the straighter valve. I apologize for the poor camera angle on this step. I then hooked up the nitrogen bottle to the center yellow line of my gauge set and then the low pressure blue line to my mini split. Be very careful here with this process since you have the ability to blow out your line set with the 2000 PSI of charged pressure on your nitrogen bottle. Not only would this wreck your unit, but it would also potentially be very dangerous to be around when the lines let loose. All right, so we have the nitrogen hooked up. It's been a few minutes holding it at about 100, 110 PSI. It's a good intermediate step. I'm gonna start stepping it up uh, by 100 PSI till we get probably around 400. The unit says the max pressure is around 600, 620 PSI, but I feel like a 400 pound pressure test to be uh, plenty adequate to make sure that we don't have any leaks. All right, so now that we're at 200, what I'll do is I'll wait another five or 10 minutes, then step it up to three, then step it up to four. I'm kind of doing this in increments as we go. There's no need to go straight to 400. Uh, then if I find any leaks, I'll kind of find it along the way. All right, it's been an hour and 15 minutes. We're still holding about 400 PSI. So I'd call this pressure test good. With a positive pressure test successfully completed, I drained the nitrogen from the system and reinstalled the straighter valve. Then I hooked the yellow line back up to my vacuum pump. You want your lines vacuumed before releasing the refrigerant into the system. Once the refrigerant valves were open, I reinstalled their protective caps. One thing I didn't like about this version of the Della unit is that there's no cover for the line set terminations like there was in my old Della unit. It's not the end of the world, but I think that the cover was a nice touch. The rest of the things I did here were just to tidy things up after I knew that the system was mechanically solid. Things like spray foaming the void in the 3.5 inch PVC, cable management, and affixing the stand to the slab. I was extremely happy when I hit that power button, and everything worked as expected. So I have this digital thermometer. Uh, I can actually link it to the phone, so I'll try to get a graph for you guys, but we're starting off here at 86 inside of the shop. Just turn the split system on. It's also 80% humidity, so uh, 86 at 80%. So what I'm gonna do is I uh, have this forklift right here and this blue box for my gauges. I'm just gonna set this guy on top of the blue box and then come back in here in an hour or two and see where it's at. All right, well, I am pretty impressed. It is at 77 degrees set on the machine. Uh, this thermometer right here, so this is the machine right here. I can feel the airflow hitting me. And then uh, this guy sitting kind of in the direction a little bit below the airflow is reading 75 right now uh, and 51% humidity. Uh, you can see the chart that I'm sharing on the side here. Uh, pretty impressive performance in my opinion. It's only been a couple of hours and uh, this thing has really already made the space livable. I think the fact that this is an insulated garage will really help uh, this thing keep up with cooling. On this topic of performance, I've had some time to play with the unit and the mobile application. What I really like is that you have full control of the unit on the app and you have the ability to schedule on and off times as well as what mode the unit will be in. I'm currently playing with a cyclic schedule that maintains a low humidity value during the days I'm not actively working in the shop in order to keep my equipment from rusting. In addition, on days I plan to be working in the shop, I schedule the unit to turn on in the morning and start cooling. This is a work in progress, but you can see the shift change on these charts showing where I brought the system online. With those results, I consider this a massive success. Like always with projects like this, I learned a bunch of new things. I got some new tools throughout the process. Both of those things are very welcome for a DIYer. Uh, the next mini split that I install, I'll do an even better job. And uh, that's how things go. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, hit the like button down below. Consider subscribing to the channel. And this is Redbeard Engineered, signing off.